going to ask you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 4 this morning. And while you're turning there, there are a couple of things I, I thought maybe I should say, and I didn't think of saying them earlier, so I'll mention them now. Uh, a couple of things. One is, um, this past week, um, I had my next appointment uh, for Lyme disease, and um, I still have Lyme. I kind of expected um, I have had a few uh, better days in the last few weeks, um, wondering if maybe the Lord is beginning to turn things around, but um, I do still have Lyme and, and still do have uh, many of the trials that, uh, that come with that. So I would appreciate continued prayer for that, that fight. The other thing I wanted to mention to you in a kind of a practical way, um, because I did that trip, I did spend some time in Georgia, Tennessee, and Kentucky this week. So if you'd prefer that I keep a little distance from you, just let me know. Be glad to do that or to pop my mask on um, if, I, if I don't have it on. Um, I did spend uh, a night at a motel in Georgia and a night at a motel in Tennessee. Um, it's got to see a little bit about of what's going on in different places, but I want to be respectful of you. If that brings you a little bit of concern, uh, please just let me know, and I'll try to keep a little more distance today anyway. And then I also wanted to mention that, um, as I mentioned we earlier, that it looks like uh, we'll be gone for the next couple of Sundays, the, the 7th for sure. Uh, be in prayer for Brian. Brian has uh, agreed to bring the, the word next Sunday. Um, but then I also wanted to let you know, uh, while we kind of took a little bit of a, of a different road through COVID, my current plan is to return to the Book of Romans on June 21st, and then, Lord willing, to continue that series to its conclusion. Um, Bonus points if you remember what chapter I'm about ready to start. You can tell me after the service this morning. This morning, I wanted to bring our attention to 1 Peter chapter 4. And, and I think that this is a, a good time for us to, to kind of reconsider, especially with kind of what COVID has done to the life of the church. It really is a good time for us to take another look at these truths. Follow along as I read 1 Peter 4, starting with verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, as we come to your word this morning, we ask that you would send your spirit to help us to understand and be doers as well as hearers of the Word. Father, we thank You as we think about the work that You've done in our church, as we think about the work that You've done in the lives of various individuals and and how You have led many to minister to one another through the years. Lord, our our hearts are filled with joy and thanksgiving as we, we consider what You have already done. But as we refocus on some of these things, Lord, we pray that you would continue to to direct our hearts, our thinking, and the ministry that you have really given all of us in the lives of one another. And we pray these things, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we've talked uh, about ministry of saints to one another through the years, in fact, there's a really one entire lecture in the church membership class that we call informal ministry, and trying to get people to understand that God's design for the church is not primarily programs, although they have a place. And what I'm saying this morning is not to cast aspersions on organization or planning or some level of formal ministry. Um, those things definitely have a place. But it's, I think, a good time for us to emphasize again that God's foundational plan for the life of the church really has more to do with God's people ministering to one another than it does to a formal top-down program. 
It seems like um, North American culture is is really taken with some things that, that maybe come out of the business world and are really based on what we perceive to be some measure of achievement or goal. Uh, we like to put on a big show. You know, we like to put on a big production in America. We like to have a lot of, of numbers and a lot of things and a lot of action. And we like to be able to look around and say, yeah, we've really kind of got something here. It's tempting to measure a church by its formal programs. I mean, even when, when we go to other churches, we have kind of that question, and it's not all bad. I mean, there's a place for it. But a lot of times our, our questions, instead of asking, you know, do the people in this church love one another, we tend to ask, what do you have for the men? What do you have for the women? What do you have for the children? Do you have an Awana circle? Do you have things for the singles, for the teens, for former addicts, for widows and widowers? What about for seniors? Well, they all have, those things have a place. Formal, organized, scheduled programs have a place, but the scriptures teach us a foundational model that in our membership class we call informal ministry. You know, what we mean by that is, is ministry without a name. Ministry without a title. Ministry that is not regularly announced from the pulpit. It's what we just read in our text. Now, since our text includes things like speaking as a part of God's gifting, uh, our text certainly includes some of the things that would be a part of the organized public ministry of the church, but it clearly goes well beyond that. So here we are in a time of COVID-19 shutdown, and we've just regathered. This is our third Sunday back, praise God. Uh, we en- we're enjoying seeing faces again that we haven't seen in a while, and, but we're still kind of uh, at the bare bones schedule, right? Um, formal programs like VBS have been shut down for this year, and Sunday school is done for the year. And, and some of the other things that we were doing, it's like, well, we're going to put that on hold till we see where some things are going. And, and so what are we left with? It's actually a healthy thing to think about. We're left, first of all, with worship gatherings, which is definitely a part of God's design. I mean, the worship gathering of God's people is foundational to the life of the church. You know, sometimes it could be helpful if you thought, if we had to get rid of everything except just the core essentials, what would it be? I think the core essentials would largely be what we see here in front of us, the gatherings, the worship gatherings of the people of God and the saints ministering to one another with the gifts that God has given them. That's what church would look like. That's what church should look like in many ways. Now again, as we bring back different emphases and ministries and evangelistic endeavors and studies and programs, um, those have a place. But we need to really think about what a church is and what is, and we've been using the word essential. Can I use the word essential? What are the essential ministries of a church? Well, I think we're, we're left with, you know, my, my title is, is, of the message this morning is kind of what we're left with. And I use this title, Serving One Another with Charisma. Now, those of you who have done a little bit of language study or have preached, you understand the word play there. In our English language, charisma kind of means somebody that has a, you know, a smooth personality. They, they kind of stick out with a certain kind of an energy and they have charisma. What I'm talking about is just right out of the text because the Greek word charisma is the word gift in our text. And so when we're talking about serving one another with charisma, we're talking about serving one another, just like you see there in the text, as each one, verse 10, has received a gift, minister it to one another. So we're talking about serving one another or ministering to one another with charisma, with the gifts that God has given us. And that's really, I think, what we're left with when we try to boil down, you know, what is essential, so to speak. And I have to say, it's been a blessing to see you all take care of one another and love each other during a difficult time. Some things I'm sure I don't know, 
but some of what I do know is encouraging to see the saints loving one another. Using your personality and your stage in life and those things that you have and all that God has made you to be to be an encouragement to minister to someone else. It could be everything from volunteering to get someone groceries if that's a good and helpful thing to do for someone. It could be encouraging somebody through vegetables, perhaps. There are a lot of different ways that that can be done that really are a part of you and I just being who God made us to be and using that to serve the saints. So clearly, my my point is not to criticize organization or pit formal ministry against informal ministry. That's not the point. But I want us to refocus on God's foundational design for relationships in the church. That it's God's people serving one another in whatever way God has gifted them. Think with me about this gifting and God's gifting. Now, it's in a, an interesting context. And you know, what's, it's interesting. Another reason I think that it's valuable for us to think through this at this time is that sometimes when things are going really well and we're in a time of prosperity, some of this doctrine actually gets a little bit too pretty. What I mean by that is it all kind of begins to take on a life that that goes beyond the essential nature of it. I'll give you an illustration. So in the text, we're told in verse 9 to be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Well, if we're living in a time of great comfort and prosperity, then something like hospitality is about doilies and place settings, and how pretty things can be. Now, I don't want you to hear me saying that those things are, are bad. If that's how God puts you together, and, and you can do that well, and it provides an opportunity for fellowship and service, that's great. But, but sometimes when we live in a time of comfort, that's what these things can just turn into, is, is an emphasis like that. But when when things are kind of stripped away and it's more of a time of tribulation, more of a time of discomfort, more of a time of, you know, what's really essential here, then you kind of realize, for instance, the concept of hospitality in the scriptures had more to do with there were people who, because they were Christians, because they were being persecuted, perhaps, because some inns were actually dirty and dangerous, (laughs) and you say, well, that reminds me of some places I've stayed that can happen. But hospitality in the Word of God was having people over in your home because a Christian home was a wonderful respite and an overnight stay as opposed to some of the alternatives, especially if you were a refuge because of your faith and trust in Christ. And so sometimes I think we sanitize these concepts a little bit because we haven't had to live that way. We haven't had to experience difficulties that provided the context for some of this teaching. But when you hear Peter give this instruction, it's much more serious. It's much more grave. There's a lot more at stake here when you're looking at first century believers who are being put to death death for their faith and having to endure really serious persecution for their faith, and it takes on a different feel. Peter says, the end of all things is at hand. Now, he wrote that in the first century. I don't think that has anything to do with what we often talk about as the end times. Peter is saying everything that God was going to do up to the point of his final return, it's all happened. So we're living in that time between his first advent and not only his first advent, but Jesus died, was buried, rose again, and then ascended into heaven. And we're living in the time between his ascension and his coming again. And that's what the New Testament writers referred to as the end times or the end of all things. But Peter is saying we're at that point in redemptive history where quite a lot has happened and now we're living in the new covenant and some of you are really struggling, but understand God's plan continues forward. There is a coming new heavens and a new earth and, and it's, it's worthy of perseverance. 
But in that context of the first century Christianity, he says the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Well, after the last week we've had and the last few months of COVID, some of this stuff begins to take on maybe a little bit of a new meaning. It's kind of like I've heard people say that, you know, you don't understand the Psalms until you go through something and then the Psalms begin to take on meaning you never understood before. Well, that can happen with other truths, can't it? So Peter's, Peter's reasoning in the context of 1 Peter 4 is at the end of chapter 3, he has reiterated Christ's sacrifice for our sins. And because Jesus has died for us, we are called to cease from living in the flesh for the lusts of men. We are called upon to live for the will of God, understanding the urgency necessary for living a faithful life. The end of all things is at hand. And then in that context, Peter specifically instructs the people of God as to how to honor God with their lives. And and so that's where he says in verse 7, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Verse 8, have fervent love for one another. We talked about that uh, recently, a whole message we gave over to that concept of loving one another, having a fervent love for one another. You know, again, I would say this, and I would even challenge us. I'm not going to re-preach all of that. I just want to bring this idea because I I think the Lord is showing us something in these days. This verse, have fervent love for one another, means something different now than it did six months ago. Prior to the whole issue of COVID and masks and all of the frustration and the politicization and the polarization of that. And now there are some very real temptations, not that we haven't had them before, but unlike certain things at least that we've never seen, you know, there, there's, we've, we've not seen some of this stuff in this particular way before. And the concept of having fervent love for one another kind of means a little something different. Because when everything is easy and the love flows naturally, the affection flows naturally, it just sounds like, yeah, fervent love. But when things get tough and you have a really different perspective on COVID than your brother or sister, and you never knew that, that they thought that way about stuff like this, it gets real. It gets a lot more real. And we're called to have fervent love for one another. And, and we're not even talking about the, the persecution of the first century. We're talking about the frustration of COVID and the, the unrest and turmoil of, of this past week. In verse 9, I've already mentioned, he says, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. And again, he's not talking about you know, pretty place setting so much. He's talking about having people in your home that need a place to stay because they don't have anywhere else to stay or maybe it would be dangerous or uncomfortable for them. Hospitality in the first century was often having people over in your home because inns were not always a place you wanted to be or could safely be. And then verse 10. And this is what I want us to focus on in our remaining time. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So let's talk a little bit about that that gift. The the word is charisma, uh, a gift of grace. I think I've mentioned this to you before from the pulpit, and if you're old enough, maybe you, you lived it, that seems like back maybe in the 80s and 90s, there was a big emphasis on like finding your gift, your spiritual gift, figuring out what it is. Do, do you all remember along the way we've had these, these different emphases that people have had fun with? I know at one point a while back, it was like, what color are you? Or what season are you? And you figure out what season you are, and then you match all your colors to to that because that's your season. Your skin color and your hair color, you know, makes you a certain season. (laughs) Sorry, I can't say that with a straight face. I know it's a lot of fun, but I I really don't care as much as it sounds like I do. Um, But it is kind of it is kind of a fun conversation, isn't it? It's kind of like the uh, Briggs Meyer type stuff, I think. 
Well, there was a time of emphasis in the church where it was all about, you know, find your gift. What's your gift? I think that the emphasis gets a little skewed with that because I, I really think that this idea of gift is more of a, of a gift package or a spiritual endowment. It's not like you just have one gift. God gives you, well, you have the gift of helps. That's it. That's all you have. That's all you're getting. Or you have the gift of mercy. It's usually a more multifaceted. You have a variety of things in your spiritual endowment. This word, I like that. It, it sounds fancy, but I, I like that because it gets the emphasis, I think, where it needs to be. Instead of thinking about it as just like one gift, like here, you have the gift of teaching and that's it. Forget compassion, buddy. No, it's a, it's a spiritual endowment, graciously or freely given by God, not just one outstanding gift like the gift of exhortation. And, and a number of, of men that I studied, I think, would say that, that this is the idea. Barnes said that this was all the gifts and graces by which we can contribute to the welfare of others. Matthew Henry said, whatever gift, ordinary or extraordinary, whatever power, ability, or capacity of doing good is given to us, we should minister or do service with the same one to another. Vincent calls this an extraordinary gift of the Holy Spirit, dwelling and working in a special manner in the individual. So what we're talking about here is a spiritual endowment, a gift package, if you will, of the, the various things that God puts into us for the purpose of ministering to others, particularly in this context, other saints. Michael Bentley, in his commentary on 1 Peter, says that they may be natural gifts, which are spiritually enhanced at conversion, or they may be specially bestowed upon a believer when he or she is saved. And I think we've probably seen that worked out. There are times, haven't you ever seen somebody, maybe some young boy or girl, and they have a personality that when they're not a believer, it's not super attractive, but it is powerful? And you say things like this, when the Lord gets a hold of that girl and those gifts and that personality is redeemed for the kingdom and for kingdom labors, what a powerful influence that young lady is going to be for Christ. But until that day, Lord, have mercy on her parents. Or that young man, and you're like, if that energy and that talent could be redeemed for God's kingdom instead of for selfish usage and for even for Satan's use. So sometimes the gift is a part of a person's personality reflecting God's image created into them, and yet when they're living in sin, it looks horrible. And when they come to faith in Christ, what a blessing, what a glory it is to see all of that redeemed for God's glory and for kingdom use. Other times, perhaps you see someone come to faith in Christ, and there are things that are developed there, things that emerge that were never seen that, that strongly before. It's like the Lord did something, maybe even as a part of conversion, that, that God did something in them that was going to be used. It doesn't really matter how it happens, but God, the Holy Spirit, spiritually, and you could even say supernaturally, it's not just natural, puts these things in His people for the benefit of His other people and for the glory of Jesus Christ. Now, there are other passages that speak about gifts. We're not going to talk too much about them today, but I just want to refer to Romans 12, 6 to 8 and say that that, that passage kind of wraps things around the same two big categories that we have here in our text. In, in our text, uh, 1 Peter 4 and verse 11, Peter says, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, that's the word deacon. If anyone serves or ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. And Romans 12 has the same two big categories, the, the ministry of the word, in that case, prophecy, which prophecy is not always telling the future. Prophecy can also be a clear forth telling of the word of God. And then secondly, service is mentioned again there. Ministry, serving each other in practical ways. 
So both 1 Peter 4 and Romans 12 establish kind of this paradigm where we commonly recognize that there are spiritual gifts that are around the ministry of the Word. Yes, the public ministry of the Word from pastors, but also the ministry of the Word of the saints one to another. And then there's a second big category of practical ministries of of helps, which are often associated with the second office in the church. So it's interesting that the offices of pastor and deacon really kind of represent uh, the gifts that are often given to all of the saints, ministries of the word and practical ministry. And that runs right on down through the people of God. And so um, there are other things in Romans 12 mentioned, like teaching is mentioned in addition to prophecy, exhorting, giving, or contributing to the needs of people, exercising leadership, and, and showing mercy. So those are some examples. But again, I don't believe the emphasis is, well, you get to be a leader, but you don't have any mercy. Um, there are some things we're all called to, right? I mean, from the text, you could say that we're all called to hospitality on some level because the saints are all instructed here in our text, it seems to me, to be hospitable to one another. Now, whether that actually means we have people over in our home, that's not even possible if you don't have a home or if you're in college or you're a kid. It's not always possible for you to do that. But I think we're all called to have a, a heart of hospitality in doing what we can to, to serve others. But we also know that there are some people who are especially good at it. And I think it's like that with a lot of things. And that's why we talk about having a a gift package. There might be some of us who are trying to get better at ministering the word to other people, maybe in that realm we might even call biblical counseling in an informal way, you know, helping somebody out with a specific situation in their lives with the truth of Scripture. And yet, most of us could point to somebody else who's a lot better at that than we are. But that doesn't mean we don't have any gifting or something that could be developed, which I think is, we'll talk about that here in a few moments. So your spiritual endowment, your charisma, your gift will really be a combination of several gifts, some more prominent than others. Some gifts might uh, become more effective as you grow, as you mature, as you nurture those gifts, as you develop those gifts and pay attention to them. Some of them are related to the stage that we are in life or to the particular dwelling place that we have. Think about it like this. Some instances of showing mercy might require the ability to to cook or to clean or to drive. Some of these things require physical health or an adequate home. The gift of teaching will be greatly helped by a good education, whether you know, formal or you know, being trained in the context of a local church. The gift of giving implies that you have something to give. Rendering practical service probably means that you have a measure of physical ability, unless it's something that can be done almost entirely on the computer. And In our day, that has actually opened up options for some people who are not very mobile, but they can do things on a computer, and, and that has opened up another whole realm of ministry for some. I think about our brother, Jim Barber. Uh, Jim, you weren't in my notes, brother, but uh, you're in the message now. Uh, Jim has been faithfully writing prisoners for for years, um, quite a few of them now. And um, he sends the elders, you know, what he writes to them, and occasionally he'll send me a note about how it's going with a particular prisoner. And uh, this is something that uh, our brother Jim, at this point in his life, is able to do, and what what an encouraging, fantastic ministry that is for Jim to do. And, And I think it's neat that he has taken that opportunity and, to, and develop that, um, even though there are other things he would feel like he probably can't do as well, uh, he does that, and he's done it faithfully for a long, long time. It's important for us to remember, too, when we think about this gift that, you know, Peter is writing in a context here, back in verses 2 to 4, he, he talks about the lifestyle of the Gentiles, 
And the lifestyle of the Gentiles was all about self. Selfish lust, selfish desires, selfish agenda. And basically, we're talking about unconverted people here. Well, Jesus turns this right around for the people that he wins to himself. Not only are we living lives of holiness instead of sinfulness, but we're living lives of selflessness instead of selfishness in stark contrast from the Gentiles of Peter's day. And this is how God has designed it. You know, God has designed to gift us for the benefit of others. I mean, he is built right into the DNA of his church, humility and service and blessing to one another. I mean, he's put it right into the DNA of the church to look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Not to do anything through selfish ambition or conceit, but to consider others worthy of preferential treatment. And this brings us to the idea of of stewardship in the text. So verse 10 again, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Kids, do you know what a steward is? Sometimes we think about a steward or a stewardess uh, being on an airplane and serving us. It's a little bit like that. Um, They serve us things that aren't really theirs. They're just serving us um, something that the airline asked them to give us. And so they're serving us. There's a similarity there. But the idea of a steward is someone who has had something entrusted into their care. It's not theirs, really. It's not really theirs, but it's been given to them for them to use to be the steward of it, the caretaker of it, and to do with it what is good and appropriate. So Peter calls us stewards of this gift. You you could say, in a sense, this gift ultimately really is God's. It's God's gifting. It's God's grace. God is the one who, who owns us. He's the one who has given this thing to us. So it's not just ours to use for our own pleasures, for our own kingdom building, for our own selfish ambition. A lot of people do that with their gifts. But for those of us who love Christ, for those of us who have been called to gospel living, we are stewards of this gift, and God gives us what we have for the good of the kingdom and for the glory of Jesus Christ. It's a helpful perspective because we tend to just naturally feel like what we have is ours, right? But when you think about it, my body, my brain, my abilities, my education, my money, my finances, the things that I'm able to do, the things that I'm able to say has been gifted to me and built into my personality for the good of the saints and for the glory of Jesus Christ. God, the creator and giver of all things, gave the gift to me to give to you. And part of caring for that endowment that has been given to me is developing it. Developing my gift will mean walking with Christ and living after the Spirit. That's how a lot of these gifts are developed for God's glory, is is abiding in the vine and living after the Spirit. But in a practical way, it will mean studying the Word. It might mean going to school for some, or cultivating a skill. For some, buying a home will give them opportunities they didn't previously have, or even renting an apartment. Maintaining a good job and bringing in the finances that will allow them to be a giver, which is a part of that gifting. And even developing relationships and the way we develop relationships are a part of that gifting. But part of being a good steward is knowing that what I have has been given to me by someone else and it's to be used for that intended purpose. I want to challenge us to continue thinking about this. I know we've, we've thought about this through the years, but let's continue seeking the Lord about cultivating a mindset of serving others with what I've been given. That, that actually solves a lot. When you, you know, cultivating that mentality. 
If God has given you a lot of talent, if God has given you a lot of ability, and you think it's yours, <laughs> it's really easy to try to build your own kingdom or manipulate things you know, to go the way you want them to go, to use that power to control situations. Happens all the time. But if we cultivate this mindset of serving others with what I've been given then I constantly see myself and my stage in life and all that I have and all that I am as a gift from God to be used for the good of the saints. And you could say, I think by extension, for the good of others in society as well. Now, back to this issue. It's not an issue primarily of whether or not you have the one perfect gift to meet the need. And that's where I think over the years, sometimes our thinking has gone off the trails a little bit here. It's like, well, I don't have the gift to teach, so I'm, I shouldn't say anything. Let me, let me show you why that's just wrong, okay? Do you think from the Scriptures, we're not going to take a lot of time here, but do you think from the Scriptures you could make a case that God calls fathers to lead their families spiritually, to instruct their children in the way that they should go? See, that's why we can't say, well, I don't have the gift to teach, so I can't lead my family in devotions. Because God has called us all to lead our children and lead our families as fathers, wives, mothers, you know, are to instruct their children in the way that they should go. So see, it's not just a matter of, do I have that gift of teaching? It's like, well, if God has commanded it, then he's given you something to use. (laughs) Use what you have. And develop what you were given. And use tools. Use the tools. We have more tools today than there have ever been throughout history. And I'm not exaggerating in saying that. I I mean, it seems to me like that's the case. We have more tools at our disposal. Let's use our tools. But you you understand the illustration. You can't just say, well, I've got to leave that up to those who have the gift to teach. Because on some level, God has gifted all of his people to teach at least enough to open up the word of God and instruct their children in the way in which they should go. Even if it's just reading the passage and, um, you know, mentioning how God has taught you from that passage or something. Doesn't mean we all have the same gift. I think we should think about it more in terms like, you know, think about your relationship with other people in the church. Instead of thinking about it primarily in terms of, do I have the gift to help here? I think what we really should be thinking is if God providentially has me in in a certain place, meeting a certain need, aware of a certain need, my first impulse should not be, let me go find a professional. My first instinct should be, God has brought me to this need. I'm aware of it. Is there something I can do? Can I use what I have to meet this need? It might not be the same as what somebody else would, would, would have at their disposal. You know, I mentioned earlier that we can all, including me, we can all point to somebody else who's a better biblical counselor. But that doesn't mean that what I have to say is invalid. That doesn't mean that, that our feeble attempts to try to minister the word to somebody's specific life situations is worthless. Even if you just express love to them, read the text and say, isn't that great? We can, we can try. We can try to minister to other people. So the question that perhaps needs to be asked more is not, am I gifted for this? But rather, am I available to meet the need? And one of the reasons I think this is really important for us is we live in a, in a society, and I would say especially in our church, we live in a society where there's very much a culture of education and pecking order and maybe even you know, designated job descriptions. And, and it's, you know, it's almost wrong to do certain things if it's not my job. You know? But we have professionalized everything and that's, uh, that has its advantages, but in the family of God, we've got to be careful that that doesn't turn into, well, I don't have the supreme gift on this. Somebody else needs to do it. I don't think that's what Peter's teaching here. I mean, Peter says, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. 
So perhaps the better question is not, am I gifted for this, but am I available to meet the need? And what would it look like for me with my gift package, with my spiritual endowment, to try to meet this need? Now, there might be times where there's a better fit. There are times where the best course of wisdom might be to refer somebody to another person in the congregation who can help them in a better way, and that's good too. But let's not be too quick to dismiss ourselves from an opportunity, especially because there are some things, guys, where it really is more of an issue of availability than gifting. And I want us to think about this, too. Think about some of those things where we're tempted to think maybe certain things are beneath us or that you know, they're not really what I do. I don't minister in those get-your-hands-dirty kind of way or something, you know? But think about it. Think about things like washing dishes after a church meal or setting up chairs or taking down chairs or wiping tables. Okay, I get it, all right? Some people are better at some of those things than others. It's true. But wouldn't you say that, that some of that really is more of an issue of humility and availability than gifting? I'm not gifted to set up chairs. I don't have the gift to wash dishes. <laughs> now, I, here's how I think we should think about it. Okay, so the task in front of me, washing dishes, setting up chairs, clearing tables, or whatever it is, I'm just using those as examples of, of service. Maybe the question is, what can I bring to that task? Would it be helpful for me to bring my sense of humor to the task of washing dishes, a task that a lot of people don't particularly care for? Or if I brought, a, my, if I brought my musical ability to the task of washing dishes and brought a sense of, of joy into it? Or maybe the person that's drying could really use a conversation and I can bring my ability to start up a conversation to that situation. So maybe the question is more, what do I bring to the situation? How is God going to use me? Sometimes that's more the question than, you know, do I have the gift of clearing tables? I think we could think that way for a lot of things too. You know, somebody brings a heartache to you and you happen to be the one listening. And maybe my first instinct might be, this is too big for me. <laughs> I can't handle this. Or unfortunately, sometimes maybe it's more like I really don't want to get involved. But if God is calling us to this conversation right now here in front of me, instead of saying, I don't really have the gift of serious conversation, maybe I should say, how has the Lord gifted me and equipped me? And what do I bring to the table to minister to this saint in front of me? You know, really, this is a part of the whole concept that we've been talking about for years now of disciples making disciples. And it's often taking place not in a formal program, but in the life and ministry of the local church of saints one to another. And instead of our first instinct being, oh, that's a spiritual question, I need to go find a pastor, maybe it's, well, let me dig into this with you and let's see what we can come up with. There may very well be a time to refer to a pastor. There will be times where it's the most appropriate thing would be to pass it to a more seasoned sister who has biblical counseling experience or to pass it to a pastor or a godly brother who has had some experience with a particularly thorny situation. But I'm just challenging us that our first reaction maybe ought to be more often, if God has called me to this need in this moment, what do I have to bring to the table? Well, and then briefly, just remember that this is all for the glory of God. I mean, this, this is designed to bring glory to Him. Look again at, uh, at verse 10. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And then verse 11. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So the ultimate purpose in all of this is the glory of God. 
God gives gifts to us to give to others, and it's all from Him. He gives gifts to us, and He ministers to us through the gifts that He gives others. And I really like this one word here, manifold, it says in the New King James. As good stewards of the manifold grace of God. You know, God's grace is is multifaceted, showing forth with a multitude of colors and shades. We're going to see in one another's lives so many interesting manifestations of God's gifting and grace. And it's going to look very different. And your spiritual endowment might be quite different from mine. But what a glory it is, what a blessing it is to see that in action. To see God doing things in in other people and through other people that I know I, I couldn't have done myself, whether it was an issue of time or whether it was an issue of I just don't really think that way. I don't really have those gifts. God used somebody else in a really particular blessed way to, you know, them being them, and and I would just not have done that in that way. I, I didn't have that gifting. And that is legitimate. It's a blessing to see that in action. So how do these gifts actually give glory to God? How do we magnify His name? And how do we declare His great worth? And how do we glorify Him? Well, I think we give glory to God when we recognize these gifts as being from His hand. We've talked about that. We give glory to God when we're good stewards of His grace to us by ministering to others, and I would say by also cultivating and developing those gifts. We talked about that. We give glory to God when we depend upon the ability that God supplies and not our own strength. It's so easy for us to begin living and acting in our own strength as if, you know, I've got this thing. I can muscle this thing into submission. I can handle this. But the language of the text is, if anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. There's something particularly God-glorifying when I am cognizant of the fact that God has given me this gift and that I only really can use it to to benefit when I tap into His supply, His strength, His grace, His enabling strength. Is it ours? Are they our gifts, our abilities? In a sense, you could say they are. They're our stewardship. It's ours to to steward. But it's God's gifting and it's God's strength. And that's humbling but that's good. If I remember that, then I'm thinking, I'm serving others with something God has given me in the strength that God gives me. And if I begin trying to do this in my own strength, there's going to be a a problem here (laughs) in maybe more ways than one. God's supply is, is lavish and abundant for the task He calls us to do. And, And by the way, it's a good time to remember too that sometimes Some of us hear messages like this and it's like, well, what am I not doing that I should be doing? That's not the point. You can't do it all. In fact, I would even say some of us need to be careful that we don't judge our own usefulness by the number of needs that we meet. God supplies us with what we need to do what He wants us to do, but think of this. Maybe some of my task is discipling others to help so that I don't have to so that I can cover more ground, so we can cover more ground. The idea of training others and discipling others to do what you're doing helps the kingdom to grow. So we give glory to God when we're careful to minister in accordance with His truth as well. Now, if it's the ministry of the Word, then we're specifically ministering the truth of God. But if it's more of the diaconal, the serving ministry of practical things, then the Word of God is guiding our actions and our thoughts and our methods. So when we go back to what Peter was saying at the beginning of this conversation, we know that Christ suffered for us. Jesus redeemed us from our sin. We owe Him our lives. 
as living sacrifices. We are His. Our moments are His. And of course, our gifts are His. By the way, I'm going to go ahead and give you the answer to the quiz question, okay? You can tell me if it was right or not. Uh, We're about ready to start Romans 12, all right? And this message is actually a, a good way to set the table for that study because Romans 12 begins with the concept of being living sacrifices and then moves right into the the subject of gifts. And so this is a wonderful bridge back into our study. Living sacrifices. Kistemacher says in his commentary, these gifts belong to God and must be used in the interest of His kingdom. The church is a veritable storehouse of gifts and talents, never locked, but always open for service. So the question that we need to ask ourselves this morning, and and this really has to do with our relationship with Christ now, is do I have that eternal kingdom perspective this morning? That it's all about Christ and His purposes, not me and my agenda. Now, for some of us, that question might just be a, a needed exhortation you know, to the life of a believer, once again, to realign our thinking with God's. But for some, this might actually be a question of salvation. If you've lived your entire life to this point with your own agenda and your own kingdom as your greatest desires, then that could be a fundamental issue of your actual relationship with Christ. If you really don't have that eternal kingdom perspective, that you really don't care about Christ and His purposes, then for you it's time to bow the knee, to turn from your sin, and to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and to begin the process of using your gifts for His glory. But for those of us who are saints, uh, we are God's people. And we use the gifts that He has given to us to steward. We use the ability that He has supplied. And it's all a part of of His kingdom, His plan, His power, and His glory. And I, I want you to notice, it's interesting that this passage actually ends with a doxology. Did you catch that? That in the middle of his instruction to the saints about how they're to conduct themselves in one another's lives, he says uh, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. It really is about the glory of God. To God be the glory. Great things He has done. And that includes the gifts that he's given the saints. So in this time where so much of our normal church life has been kind of stripped or maybe paused, you know, put on hold for a bit, I really think it's a wonderful time to reset our thinking and remember that, that this is really the foundational life of the saints. Yes, the gathered meeting of the saints in worship and the proclaimed word of God, that will never change at Arbor Church as long as I'm alive and I would say as long as you're alive. That's never going to change at Arbor, is it? We are going to gather in worship with the proclaimed Word of God as the centerpiece as God has designed. But outside of that gathering, the gifting of the saints to minister to one another is really God's blueprint for how the church ought to live. And I think that actually goes back to the other things Peter said. Love one another fervently with the gifts God has given you. Uh, Be hospitable with the gifts that God has given you. You know, use what God gave you for the advancement of the kingdom and for the blessing of the saints. So I hope that's an encouragement to you. Maybe there's a challenge in there, but I hope it's not a burdensome challenge. I hope it's a joyful challenge to say, Lord, that was a helpful reset. Um, How am I doing this? Or are there ways in which I can sharpen the way I'm looking to allow my gifts to be used in the assembly of the saints? And, and what are you doing and working in my life in this way? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for all the gifts that you give to your people. We thank you for, especially we think of you, the, the, the gift of grace, of salvation, forgiveness of sin, and a right relationship with you, our Creator God. But we also, Lord, are thankful that you gave gifts to us to use in the lives of our brothers and sisters. 
And Lord, it's a, it's a joyful thing to see that in action and to see how you created us and how you made us to serve one another. But Lord, it's also true that there have been times that perhaps we've been selfish with those gifts or in a place in our own lives where we're not very usable. And so we pray, Father, that you would reinvigorate our hearts to be used in your kingdom for the good of your people and for the glory of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.